Our speaker tonight is Teresita Majewski. Um, I first met her as a WE undergraduate when she was a, a senior graduate student at the uh, Department of Anthropology at the U of A. And she is currently um, one of the leading scholars at Statistical Research Incorporated. And her specialty is in historic archaeology, and I'm very much looking forward to this talk. So Teresita, take it away. Well, thank you, Doug. And I will give one small clarification that um, I actually came to Arizona to work um, on American Antiquity when Jeff Reed was, was the editor. So I was already, I got my degree at University of Missouri, and um, they would be upset if I said I got my degree at U of A. But I feel like a U of A graduate because I've been here since 1990, so I'm not really, well, many of you say that, you know, after a quarter of a century, you're sort of a resident of Tucson. So I'm very honored to be here <laughs> and um, a little bit in awe of, of the company, and um, I'm thrilled to have been asked. Thank you for this. So um, when Kate and I talked about the title of my talk, it always seems like a really great idea, right, months ago. and. You go, oh, I'm going to talk about the growth and promise of historical archaeology and academia and CRM. So I've dithered about this for, for weeks because it's, that's just the way I am. But I think this will all come together. And um, there's such a strong uh, emphasis on prehistory in Arizona. So um, I hope none of you take offense to my comments. But um, you know, I, I have pretty much of a, a strong feeling about historical archaeology and the fact that there is so much promise in Arizona. So, um, so to talk about historical archaeology, we have to talk about history and about archaeology because it's that is part of the conundrum when we talk about teaching it, practicing it, and um, having it be integrated with things like anthropology. So if we define history, um, I looked up a few definitions, and uh, one is what the present thinks about the past, not what happened in the past. Rather, history is what a living society does with the past. Events of the past which are not studied and are not thereby incorporated into a culture's vision of itself are not part of history. They happened, yes, but they're not part of history until a historian with a specific purpose, which is related to his or her own time and culture, picks up those facts and use, uses them. And all of us who seek to understand events in the past do so from the vantage point of the present. And then in 1988, um, T. Kyler Young, um, there was a special issue of American Antiquity in 1988, and he, he wrote about, I think, history and archaeology and how it related. And he said that remembered history is also the collective memory of a living society and interrogating the past in the name of a living society. So you have those aspects of interrogation, analysis, um, not so unlike what we do in anthropology, really. Um, so if we move on to historical archaeology, uh, Patricia Rubertone, in an article she wrote about Native American historical archaeology in 2000, said that today definitions of what constitutes historical archaeology are more broadly conceived than ever before. And I would say that that statement 17 years later is still very accurate. And on the Society for Historical Archaeology uh, career brochure, they say that this, it's the study through the use of material and written evidence of peoples and cultures that existed during the period of recorded history. And then on their website, they've updated that definition a little bit. And they note that it's the archaeology of the modern world. Most historical archaeologists focus on the period after the 15th century. And it's global in scope and deals with all groups of people, not simply those of European descent. So uh, most of you have probably heard of James Dietz, who is a very famous historical archaeologist, um, but actually did a dissertation on Mandan and Arikara archaeology from the Middle Missouri Trench. But then he started working... Uh, in the southeast, I mean, in the in the east, and became really well known for his um, the way he wrote about historical archaeology. And today, the Society for Historical Archaeology has the Dietz Book Prize because he wrote so many books that were accessible to the public. Um, 
So, but he said that it's the archaeology of the spread of European societies worldwide beginning in the 15th century and their subsequent development and impact on native peoples in all parts of the world. And then uh, he said, unfortunately, this definition is based on intellectual roots that lie in the wrong direction. And he said, with apologies to my prehistorian colleagues. And later on, just a few years uh, later, he said that um, he really talked about, you know, it was the spread of European cultures throughout the world, but also their, their interactions with indigenous peoples. And that historical archaeology must adopt a global perspective on its data. And early on when historical archaeology started, because it, it really started in the 30s um, and afterwards when people were starting to reconstruct places like Jamestown, they used archaeology to excavate uh, wall trenches around houses to try to reconstruct houses appropriately. Um, the Park Service was very active in it and um, J.C. Harrington, Pinky Harrington was uh, trained in architecture and, and archaeology and he, he brought it about, but he felt that it was really mostly about old white guys. And, um, it, and it really, it took years, it took really till the 60s when, um, you know, an era of social unrest and, and change in academia and intellectually that people said that it needs to be more. We need to think about all the people that were affected by this colonial behavior. And so, uh, you know, Dietz was right there to talk about this, but he also cautioned us, it can never be the most expensive way to learn something we already know. So that, that highlights the, the sort of, you know, is, is history, is the written word the only way, is it, does it have primacy or does archaeology? So people fought about it and then they fought about is it history or anthropology? And a lot of it began in, um, with historians. And so the key words are though that it's based on text and archaeology and that's what really developed. So the, the Society for Historical Archaeology was just 50 years old this January and so it's quite a bit younger than the SAA. But it started like in 1958. This is fascinating. There was a, um, a symposium at the AAA with people like Ed Jelks, Stanley South, Ed Larrabee, and John Cotter. And then they had a symposium on the role of archaeology in historical research. So then they, it took them until 1967 to get a, the first meeting of the SHA together. And they, they were thrilled that they had 112 participants. And so that's what we were celebrating this year, the 50th, and now the society is the largest society in the world that, do, that deals with historical archaeology, the, the archaeology of the modern world, and it has a lot of international members and connections. Um, a very different society really than SAA just in terms of scale. So I wanted to bring up um, really the differences with um, separating prehistoric and historical archaeology into distinct subfields. And so it's very interesting because the, the SHA website for years has done um, a guide to, it's really not programs in historical archaeology, but it's a guide to departments that offer classes in historical archaeology. So uh, years ago we decided to take program out of the name because a program is really very different where there's a real commitment that that's one of the strengths of your department, right? So, um, so there was a really key article that's on this sheet I, I gave you um, by Kent Lightfoot in 1995. And it was really a key article, I think, to be published in American Antiquity. But, um, and he comes from a tradition, uh, I think he's at one of the California universities where there isn't a great tradition of historical archaeology in the sense of the Pinky Harringtons and the James Dietzes. His was more coming out of working in late prehistory and the early colonial period. So, um, so he felt that, um, when you separate prehistoric and historical archaeology and have different people, for example, excavating at Fort Ross where he worked, um, so prehistorians worked on the colonial or the 
the contact period villages outside of the fort and historical archaeologists worked on the fort and they didn't really talk to each other and they were, were talking about interactions here and they they weren't getting it and <laughs> And so um, they didn't really combine, you know, uh, come to terms with the ethnohistoric and ethnographic sources that they needed to use. And then, um, you know, how do we deal with looking at long-term change using archaeological materials? And he also said that it's key to use pan-regional comparative analyses, especially because the colonial experience, um, it had its regional variants, but if the Spanish had their model for colonization and you know lo being aware of what's going on in the southeast and the southwest together it's very important to to paint a full picture um, and most programs train scholars that are regionally specific you know and I it, when I came from my Midwestern training and I came to Arizona I was kind of surprised about how people did archaeology how you know they were like oh there couldn't possibly be any artifacts left on the surface like in a plowed field and I'm like uh, well we're in in sort of in the Midwest we're finding paleo Indian points are really early archaic points in fields that have been plowed for 300 years like what's going on here so and then I was I was really surprised by all the trenching and and stuff like that and you know the methods are very different so so really what Lightfoot was saying was that we need to be more complementary in how we look at uh, what we're trying to discover. You know, if you're studying households, you can't simply trench through them. You might have to do an open, a, a very large excavation and look at the relationship of all the features together. Um, but that, that was a really important article. So, so where, you know, if people have to be trained in documentary history methods and in material culture, what's the appropriate training for historical archaeologists? And where do students obtain it? And if you look at this guide to higher education and historical archaeology, they say that 68 institutions are listed in the guide. And I was really sad to see that Arizona, if it was if this is this year's guide in 2017, um, it's Barbara it still has you as chair as head of the program. So obviously it hasn't been updated for a couple years. And then Barney Pavao is no longer at Arizona. So um, so that made me sort of sad because when I came here, I thought that there was the richest possible archaeological base for historical archaeology. And, um, you know, questions not just about colonialism, about Native American adaptations to that, um, but about, you know, mining, you know, you know all the kinds of early settlements and things like that and and the clash of cultures and um, and I think if we go back to looking at the history of probably both departments the major departments of anthropology maybe all three um, d deep grounding in prehistory and if, if you go back to most of you know knew Jim Ayers I suspect and Jim was always ruining the fact that Historical archaeology was, what do they say, the red-headed stepchild? And, you know, he was there during a lot of this. He worked with Bunny Fontana, who uh, many of you, I'm sure, knew. Um, and Bunny did his quiet thing and promoted historical archaeology, but it was never an easy sell at Arizona, that's for sure. Um, and sometimes people... Um, excavated historical period sites sort of on accident because maybe they were a stage stop or they were um, something related, you know, a Native American village related to um, a presidio or something like that. But the early sites were very, um, they were more, um, you know, big picture sites like, um, like the presidios or, or things that people heard about in the historical record and very little was done on everyday sites, you know, homesteads and things like that. Um, and one of the things that, that happened was that with the advent of the National Historic Preservation Act in the 60s, it created um, a reason, a mandate for looking at, at sites that were 50 years old or older and when the act first started people even the feds were arguing about how important it really was to look at these sites and um, and so 
but it, it certainly helped create the CRM industry and if an agency archaeologist was doing his or her job, they would insist that you would record all the sites that you found. And, um, but I think, um, I, I joined SRI in something like 93, 94, does that sound about right? And very few, very few of the companies had on staff historical archaeologists. Sometimes, I think before that, SRI um, had someone that they worked with, but it wasn't, you didn't have all that much work in historical archaeology, right? So um, it was interesting when I, uh, when Jeff Altrell asked me if I wanted uh, to join the company and develop the historic program, I, it was just, it was a great opportunity for me. Um, but boy, did I have a hard sell with my colleagues. They're like, well, why do we have to do this? And why, you know, what about this material culture? And um, so that was, luckily, I came from a university that that was a big deal, where you had, um, you were trained in material culture and you were expected to look at a lot of it for your dissertation. So, <laughs> so I did that. And um, it's a very different kind of field in historical archaeology. There's a, a plethora of things, you know, with industrial production, there are so many kinds of artifacts, new materials, that um, it's very difficult to learn every artifact material class that you need to know. Um, and so, um, so I worked a lot with Jim Ayers on, you know, providing, we, we used to teach a class at the U on material culture. We used to give lectures to different, um, at, the, at the Historic Preservation Conference, to the site stewards, to different, in different states, we'd, we'd give material culture classes. But there, uh, it still comes back to the fact that you, um, I see less and less training in material culture except in a very specialized way if someone on a faculty is interested in that. And that's, that's very sad because it hampers our ability to accurately date sites, interpret their function, determine their significance. Um, and this is something actually that um, one of the SHPO archaeologists called me about and said, we've got to do something about you know, improving the quality of historical archaeological reports because it doesn't do much for me if it simply says you have some crockery. Or, I mean, can you imagine reading a prehistoric report that says we had some low-fired pottery? And that's all. And you'd be like, what? This person is incompetent. You know, so it's, it's just very sad that, um, that it, that's a very hard thing to do, keep the comparative collections you need to do, uh, training in historical archaeology, or even probably in prehistory to have those collections. And so um, that's, that's kind of a sad thing. Um, this whole idea of another thing that I had to really fight with my colleagues is that you can't just randomly adopt historical facts in, in your reports. It's like being, um, being a true journalist that actually weighs evidence and you have to have a preponderance of evidence and a couple different sources before you say that something's true. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's actual real truth and imagined truth or whatever it's, it's called today, but, uh, but I mean, I was trained by actually one of the really best ethno-historians in plain studies and, um, you know, it's, there's, there's things that you do to evaluate your sources and, and that's a very difficult thing because you can get, you could spend your entire, like, career in an archive and still not be done with your dissertation. So I tell my students, you know, really tailor those problems down if you're going to go to the archives because you have the rest of your life to, to look at them. And, and uh, they're not, they're not, uh, it's much better than it was all the years ago that I worked on it, but, um, but it, they're specialized training. So one of the things that um, the SHPO office did when Carol Griffith was there, she was the deputy SHPO, and she was, she had studied with Jim Ayers, under Jim Ayers when he was teaching at ASU. And so she had a real passion for historical archaeology and she pushed it in that office with, with SHPO's support. So she created a committee called the SHPO Advisory on Historical Archaeology or something committee. So uh, those of us that did historical archaeology in the state would meet uh, informally. But we created a number of really important documents. So uh, one of them on your list is the very first one, Ayers, Griffith, and Majewski. We compiled um, a guide, a research guide for historical archaeology in Arizona. And it's been updated at least six times. 
and it's really a great guide where you go for different kinds of resources and um, and it's and we usually have a session about uh, about it at the historic preservation conference almost every year so that it can get out to more people um, but when Carol left um, Jim Cogswell who many of you know from Shippo uh, took over that committee and it just was really difficult for him to do with all of his other compliance work so um, the governor's archaeology advisory commission is that right they they um, they took under their wing the historical archaeology advisory committee <laughs> so it's part of that now and it, it has and Tom Jones from ACS um, does a really good job of hurting us cats but he um, and so we meet a couple times a year we give sessions at the preservation conference we update things but one of the important things that we did besides this guide was we developed a context on one of all of our favorite kinds of um, archaeological sites a refuse scatter because more and more dumps were being found <laughs> and we didn't know how to evaluate them so we d we do these mundane things like write contexts about things that people really don't want to deal with so we wrote one called down in the dumps so and it's on the website and it's very helpful uh, we're doing a project at Davis Monthan and we just learned that there's probably going to be up upwards of a hundred refuse scatters and our um, the person in charge of the field part of it she's um, a prehistoric archaeologist with experience in historical archaeology but she said what should we do I said read down in the dumps because it really helps you understand you know what um, how to evaluate those sites so we, we talked a little bit about the training um, you know I I would love to see well you have two kinds of departments like I said ones that have a concerted program where they advertise themselves as like one of the main departments in historical archaeology and then you have other departments that kind of put it together for students who want to come there and I think um, you know Arizona has a lot of great people that contribute and I'm I'm an adjunct faculty there and so Barbara you and I tend to be on a lot of committees together because of your work but we have you know Tom Sheridan is also on many committees and um, you know we have a good group but I I would love to see more emphasis on that and I don't know if that's just you know everyone has to make decisions and now that it's the school of anthropology with all the different pieces um, maybe it's very difficult but uh, when I do teach I tell my students I teach research design and historical archaeology and I tell them how lucky they are to be in a department that has people from classics and other fields that um, that help broaden their view of what archaeological sites are and time depth of archaeology and methods and things like that um, but let's talk a little bit about the challenges of doing historical archaeology within a CRM context and I talked a little bit about how the CRM industry focuses um, on historical archaeology um, I think most of the larger firms in Arizona uh, now have at least um, one historical archaeologist on staff I know that the desert has Homer Teal and he's you know he's been with them a long time he's big on material culture knows his research and things like that um, uh, and ACS has um, Tom Jones and then uh, Logan Simpson has um, some uh, Mark Hackbarth and I'll talk a little bit about a, a recent article that he and um, that Garrity did that's that's really important on historical archaeology the, the number of sites that have been recorded in Arizona since the National Historic Preservation Act um, and then at um, SRI's route was to create a historic program and we have the head of the program now is a historian um, and we have historical archaeologists and other folks that do things uh, but we do a, a lot of built environment work too so so basically there's that challenge of training like if you're in the department the school of anthropology you're not going to get that built environment training unless you go over to the certificate program and um, in preservation or, or something like that so it's it's you have you know to get yourself ready for CRM those are the kind of things you have to you have to do or you learn on the job which is what most of us did of my generation but anyway I want to talk a little bit about this article and I put it on there it's uh, Hackbirth and and Christopher Garrity and they did a in this nice volume uh, celebrating 50 years of the National Historic Preservation Act so if you're members of 
if you get the Journal of Arizona Archaeology, you'll, you will have seen that um, late last year. Um, but what they did was they, they took a sample of historical period sites recorded in as site, and they compared rural and urban sites, and they, you know, they noticed that there were certain, very few things really recorded even before the 70s and then into the 80s. And some of it was, like I said, people at Arizona, at U of A or elsewhere would excavate these really famous historical period sites, colonial sites, or whatever. But um, they felt that maybe their sample was biased because um, a lot of the historical archaeological sites are found on federal lands that aren't, those sites don't go into as site anymore, or on the tribal lands. So, for example, Grick for years has been really focusing on uh, historical period sites on the reservation. And um, I was a reviewer for a lot of their reports many years ago before they were actually released. And I was impressed by how much work they put into it and things like that. Um, but until we really, someone does a study combining all those things, and that would take a lot of work to have to go back through all those reports and so forth. Um, um, you know, clearly the act had a big um, effect on the number of sites recorded um, and will probably continue to do so. Well, hopefully. So what kinds of projects are out there for firms to bid on? Um, it's very rare to have a strictly historical archaeological project, except you do get them in urban settings. So for example, SRI worked on the Joint Courts Project and excavated uh, the cemetery from uh, with burials from eight, uh, the 1850s to, to 1870s, uh, almost 1,300 burials, a really significant project. Um, Desert has worked on many sites, uh, sm uh, smaller sites in uh, cemetery sites, other homestead sites in in the Tucson Basin that are really important. You know, SRI's done some other ones. Also, firms in Phoenix have worked on a lot of the very large projects um, like associated with the light rail or the building of the stadium and, and things like that. So when you get, you know, if you go back to urban renewal here in Tucson, that was really very piecemeal. And it's a hugely significant collection that is um, largely unstudied in ASM, you know, from, uh, from urban renewal, even though some people wrote on parts of it. And um, there have been a few dissertations on some of it too. Um, so most of what we work on are we encounter historical archaeological sites on surveys. And so that's, that's hard to, to really make much of when the data that we collect when we record sites on survey. And so Jim Cogswell called me last week and said, we've, we've got to look at ways to get beyond criterion D, only looking at that to evaluate historical archaeological sites. What if we, are there ways that we can improve the way we look at the other criteria, which include importance to history, important people, and, um, and sort of design criterion C and work of a master. So right now I'm working on a multiple property nomination for uh, Patton's Desert Training Center camps in California. And uh, in the past, people have looked mostly at, um, strangely enough, they've looked at the archaeological criteria, which um, they're missing out. So when this multiple property nomination, it keeps going back and forth to Shippo, and they say, well, why aren't you looking at Patton, Criterion B, because he's, you know, this was his masterpiece to, to create these. Or why aren't you looking at the bigger picture of history or, or even Criterion C? So I think we have we have people at Shippo that care about this and are trying to work with all of us in the state, and I think that that's that's really important. Um, so evaluating historical archaeological sites for the National Register um, is done like any other thing through research designs and historic contexts. And um, I think we're often faced in CRM with not, not having an understanding from our clients of what it takes to really create a historic context that you can't you can't have eight hours of someone's time to research and write up a context that you use to evaluate. Um, and in this 
what's often happening now in this highly competitive environment is much work goes to the lowest bidder, which is unfortunate. So uh, that it's not about trading off value and and those kinds of things. Um, but one of the biggest challenges we have is what kinds of material evidence do we need to answer the questions that we pose, right? And I and I think that that's a critical question in prehistory and in history uh, as well. Another challenge that we have is when we work on interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary projects. Uh, years ago, I worked on a big French colonial project south of St. Louis where we had a lot of, um, we worked a lot with historians and we got lots of grant funding for them to go to the archives to look at things that would help us interpret the sites that we found. And there was this constant headbutting, like what they thought was important. We just wanted them to find things that would help us identify the sites and the function, because it was uh, fascinating, all these different things that were going on in this, in this basin. And um, it took more work just trying to, to get us to talk to each other. So how, you know, how do we stop talking past each other and about the same things? And I, I'm not sure that how people feel that that's still I think it's still difficult to have these interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary projects. Um, another huge problem with in historical archaeology are curation issues. Um, it can be as local as uh, when some of the papers came out of uh, GAC about curation, the curation crisis in Arizona. Uh, to my mind, there was a lot of finger pointing at historical archaeological collections because there there's lots of stuff. It tends to be bulky and deteriorating a lot of it, like tin cans, you know. Um, and, but it, because people didn't have they didn't have the tools to really think about the questions that went with these classes of material classes, and so I think they tended to to do what they did in prehistory was save everything. And we still haven't gotten where we need to go with that. But I'm on this group called, it's a collections consortium of people from SAA, SHA, the Feds, and the American Cultural Resources Association. And we're, we talk about different curation issues. And one of the people on, in our group is um, the federal archaeologist that tends to write a lot of this stuff. <laughs> That any directives that come down, and so she's she's been working on one on deaccessioning or culling, and so I mean these are all really um, difficult. Like, do you cull collections that you already have, or do you think harder about what you collect in the field and have better research designs? Um, but even among the historical archaeological community, they argue about not needing to save everything. So I, I'm really conflicted about this, and I would like to hear what everyone else says, because I feel if we can't, if we still aren't really that good at identifying it, how can we be throwing it out? You know, so that, that worries me a little bit. Um, so, so I talked about, um, you know, uh, the Joint Courts project we did at the Alameda Stone Cemetery, and, um, it was, I don't know if you've seen this book, we did giant reports for Pima County, but we also did one ca called Uncovering Identity in Mortuary Analysis. And I was struck by the fact that what a collection, what preservation to study some uh, really significant questions. And we've tried to get the word out on, on this project and people from all over the world have contacted us to study some of the remains or they're interested in it because of the preservation. Um, and it, I just felt it was a really significant and moving project. Um, and I apologize because I tend to talk about m my own projects because that's what I think about. So we talked about the Desert Training Center, um, which is really exciting because it talks about historical archaeology coming into the near present and even into the present. So if we're uncomfortable with studying things that maybe our own grandparents discarded or we may have discarded if we're over 50. <laughs> um, and we had Bill Rathjay here asking those questions a long time ago. And people thought, I mean, come on, we, we could do a poll of faculty at the U of A and they would probably think, 
Bill was Bill. It was, it was fascinating, but, you know, uh, there were questions then. How relevant is this? You know, and so really, uh, you know, I would pose that question to you. How relevant is the archaeology of the present or the near present? Is it important to study the archaeology of World War II or of the Holocaust or of slavery? I mean, and, and people in Europe are really engaged with historical archaeology and with, and, and, and so I think that's something that we could use as a model when we're trying to talk about why archaeology is important, and that's really more important now than it ever was. Um, also, you know, working with tribal folks, and we have such an opportunity here in Arizona, the relationships we've all developed with uh, many of the tribal peoples, and I know some of you have worked closely with them on their his on their historical archaeology, and how do they feel about it? We were fortunate to work on the Apache Scout project at Fort Huachuca a long time ago, and I was stunned to know that the last scouts were mustered out in 1947, and they sure weren't scouting anymore then. They were actually putting on shows for visiting dignitaries, and so the, here are these here are these people that came and worked as scouts for the military and made decisions when maybe their own tribes thought that they were selling out. And why did they make those choices? You know, they, um, why did they become educated, you know, sort of in the white men's ways? And it, it's really fascinating because we got to interview the children of some of the scouts and it was very, it was, I thought it was this hugely significant project and it couldn't be done now because all those children are gone. You know, but uh, but I just felt that it was, we have these opportunities to study change and identity and conflict in uh, these everyday settings that we don't, we don't think about. Also, some other work that we did at Fort Huachuca was on some homesteads that were unfortunate enough to have been homesteaded <laughs> on land that, that uh, Fort Huachuca wanted. And so they wanted it so bad that they parked tanks and shot them over their property until they finally agreed to move. And, um, and then, and then you th and one of my research questions was the growth and impact of Sierra Vista and Fort Huachuca together. And, the, you know, and, and, and so trying to look at more than just, you know, the early the Indian Wars history of the fort, you know, and, and also sort of the black history at the fort and how you know, the black soldiers were gulagged there because who in the world would even go down and look at them in southeastern Arizona? You know, so it's, um, um, it's interesting what, um, Arizona is a microcosm of every other social thing that was going on in the rest of the country, I think, for the last couple centuries. Just, it was kind of accelerated here, right? So, um, but anyway, I would, I would challenge you to think about how we can do a better job of preparing people to do historical archaeology, supporting them in doing it, um, learning about it ourselves, because it's, you know, even if we're most interested in one aspect of prehistory rather than something else, um, I think it's it, it's sort of one of those post-colonial things that brings you kicking and screaming into the 21st century when you think of some of the things. Um, but anyway, so if you're interested, take this list with you, and uh, I put some of the classics on there if you want to read up on historical archaeology, a few of the newer things, um, some websites that you could look at, um, and I am open to questions because my voice is getting a little, and I didn't even have a coughing spell, so that was good. Yay. Okay, any questions? Over here. Hi, Terry. Hi. Um, can you give some thought on how does historic archaeology relate to historic preservation zones in terms of defining them or fine-tuning or creating further protections for them, or is, is that strictly an administrative decision by the government to define a historic zone? You mean something like here in Tucson, yes, for example? Yes, exactly, like Armory Park, like Presidio et al. Um, okay, well, there's two things. So, so we have National Register districts. And then we have the city created preservation zones that are actually a zoning overlay that is much more restrictive and provides more protection than if you're just a National Register district. But it just so happens that Armory Park is both, right? But it, it wouldn't have the protection it does without the, the city zone. 
Um, I remember when, I'm also chair of the Historic Sites Review Committee for Arizona, and we get very few strictly archaeological nominations, and that's because most federal agencies, if you just recommend something as eligible, they treat it as if it's eligible. You know, so they don't have to go through the whole process of nominating, you know, hundreds of sites. For what? I mean, they still have to treat them the same way whether they do that paperwork or not. Um, but then you have the other sites, like buildings and so on, and very rarely do we ever include criterion D as something that makes something eligible. You know, and I think that, um, I know the one way the city has dealt with that, and I, I could be wrong, so anyone that knows better than me, please tell me, is they've developed an archaeological sensitivity map, and Bill, didn't you guys work on that? So, so that it's really, if there's anything that you think is there, th they always look at it. So I think that, you know, Tucson is really very good about that, but that's mostly on city property. Yes, so, um, so really it would be, and I, I don't believe it's in the ordinance for privately owned property that's subject to the zoning ordinance. Does that make sense? But that's something to certainly ask about. I mean, if there's clearly archaeological features associated with these, these, these older homes. I mean, for example, when we, we did a project when they built the hotel right near Main Gate. How many years ago was that? I don't remember. Jeff, do you remember? It could have been like the late 90s, but all, all we could get at that time was the ability to follow the bulldozer, basically, and excavate some of the privies and wells that were there. Um, but, yeah, I mean, and that happened with, you know, uh, with urban renewal as well when they were going in and excavating in all hours, you know, of trying to collect stuff. So to answer your question, I don't think we think enough. And when Jim Ayers was chair of the Historical Commission, he was like, we shouldn't bring up archaeology too much because people don't want to hear about it, like it within, the, within the context of the commission. And um, I thought that was odd, but I, maybe that came from his bad feeling with the way urban renewal was handled. I don't know, Jim, Jim had a lot of anger about how things were, and I think over the years he mellowed out a little bit, but um, there were some things we just didn't talk about, and we actually worked together a lot. <laughs> so that didn't really answer your question, but um, it would be nice if people would, if they have something archeological in their, on their property that they don't disturb it or What I was concerned with is what I see as a change in appreciation for the historic values of the neighborhoods, and, and going more towards the infill districts, and you know, the, there's a there's an erosion of the historic uh, appreciation, if you will. And I was just wondering what the archaeological community could do, if it, anything, to represent or strengthen those arguments against that kind of influx? I don't know if I'm making any sense. Or not. No, you are. I mean, I think that that's a challenge. I mean, that's something we could, we should talk with Jonathan Mabry about. Does he have any ideas on that? Um, and I think that, you know, the whole idea of, of infill is a really difficult one because I think now that they're seeing downtown move forward, there's some hard choices that are being made and that we're not all happy with those, but yeah. So, any other questions? Terry, what do, you, what do you see, going back to the first part of your talk, what do you see as um, the importance of uh, geography and early geographers in um, the developing the history of historical archaeology? I'm thinking of Carl Sauer and those types of people. Ellsworth Huntington. Well, I think that their work was very important in especially understanding culture contact, colonialism, you know, because I remember reading their work when I was in graduate school, and we won't tell you how many years ago that was. But I mean, it, it was classic because it made us think outside the box in terms of, and it was really the, the foundation for a lot of um, 
sort of the landscape views and you know what what the GIS technology of today can can provide us they provided us a way of thinking about it you know the early geographers does that make sense and and I think that geography is a very cultural geography especially is a very productive field to meld with archaeology in general because they might prod us to think about things we're not otherwise thinking of and I think some of the early concepts when we talked about you know catchment areas um, you know all those things back in the 70s that were becoming big that that was one field we borrowed from in archaeology you know we and like we borrowed from statistics we borrowed from ecology and things like that but it wasn't for me it wasn't well integrated I had to take classes in other departments and my department frowned on that but I think now there's um, departments and schools that actually have people that are trained up in that in a more multidisciplinary way. I don't know if that makes sense. I mean, um, you know, Jeff, you might be able to speak to that with like archaeological modeling, the influence of like when you were trained up, was it just that you had a particularly clever professor that actually looked outside the box or? Oh, I'm wanting him to answer that. I'm making him answer it. <laughs> So I can't just sit here. Um, no, no. <laughs> well, um, I don't. You know, I don't know if I can answer that question. I, I, I really don't know. Um, but I, I was going to comment on something else, if that's okay. The, uh, okay. The, uh, you know, in 1966, when, when the act was passed, the National Historic Preservation Act, it was, it was pushed by the old buildings people. It was their act. It wasn't, archaeology was not part of it. It really came out of New York. It came out of the destruction of historic neighborhoods by mostly interstates and transportation corridors. And uh, <coughs> archaeology came very late. The SAA was asked after the congressional hearings, um, would you join? And it was important because, frankly, it was controversial then. And uh, the whole idea of preserving old stuff uh, was not something that went over real well. But uh, <coughs> it had its champions, particularly the first ladies, and uh, uh, it was passed. But the point was is that the schism between the historic part of the act and the archaeology part of the act um, probably lasted, uh, well, it still exists to some extent today because we, we treat old buildings differently than we treat archaeological sites. But it also <laughs> affected how archaeologists dealt with things because the old, the old buildings people really did feel, I think at the time, that they were taking care of history, mm -hmm. that archaeology really didn't have a lot to say to them. Mm -hmm. And I think we lived with that legacy for a long, long time. And uh, it was really until people like Terry got their degrees and became active, and the Society of, for Historical Archaeology was formed in, in the late 60s, that it became a movement. Uh, and so some of what we're talking about is, is, is part of the history of historic preservation. It's not just a schism within archaeology. The other thing I would say, which, which is interesting, because Terry is very involved in this, <coughs> one of the current big issues in historical archaeology is people taking control of their own history. <laughs> and so uh, for a long time, archaeologists, frankly, were sort of white elitist and uh, the smart people. Um, and that has shifted so that um, a lot of indigenous people are now taking care of their heritage. Uh, Terry and I participated in a conference on slavery. And what was interesting was not that the Brits and the Americans, they, I mean, the, slaver, the slave owners were pretty clear about what the archaeology should be. What was interesting was the archaeologists from Brazil and Cuba and Africa who had a very different idea of what we should study and how historical archaeology should be done. And that it was really about social justice. It had very little to do with science. And so I, I think there are trends in historical archaeology that are moving that are really quite fascinating to watch. <laughs>
So I hope I dodged the question I was supposed to answer. No, no, that was good. But um, I had something else to say about that. Let me think if I can bring that back. Oh, an interesting thing is that, so I was trained as a prehistorian because there were no programs that were strictly historical archaeological. So I, I started out working in the Midwest and then in Mexico and then in Guatemala. And then when I was finishing my dissertation research in Guatemala, um, the guerrillas and the army both came to us and said, neither of us can protect you, so you better leave. And so I was like, what? Like, what, what will I do with my artifacts? <laughs> you will leave them here. <laughs> So um, so I went back to Missouri quite depressed, and then that's when, in the early 80s, I got involved in historical archaeology. I got handed a beautiful project to work on, and I've never looked back. Um, but so people like me that had their foot in, like in prehistory and then learned these other skills um, sort of later in my graduate career, the generations after me are fully trained as historical archaeologists, so they're they're the people that are taking it in the field in a different direction, and and so I think that's that hadn't been really seen before. Does that make sense? I mean, that's kind of what you're saying, Jeff. That uh, these young people that we heard at the conference in Curacao were very different, and some of it is just post-colonial thinking. But I would like to see those new ideas combined with the intellectual rigor of the stuff that I learned and moving forward with it, you know, using it as um, not just, it's not just true because I say it is or I believe it, you know, I think that would be sad because we wouldn't, I mean, we, it's not just about a job, it's because we all love archaeology, we love, you know, its role in anthropology and the human condition, so it would, it would be sad if it all changed, so other Did questions? So, Terry, one of the, at Archaeology Southwest, we're, the, uh, the public audience is a really important element of what we try to focus on. And I think the, one of the things I wanted to express was just kind of a concern about, I understand the, you know, historical issue of, you know, historical archaeology and prehistoric focus being, you know, not together and talking to each other and, and integrated. You look at old archaeological surveys and people record prehistoric sites, but they don't even see the <laughs> historic sites. It's just they're, why would I bother to record that? So mm -hmm. there is, and I think that's something that the cultural resource management uh, framework has caused people to focus on, you know, the full array of things. But I guess the this community here, the most, I think, one of the most successful issues of our Archaeology Southwest magazine has been the one called Tucson Underground, and that featured your uh, Joint Courts project. Uh, there's a whole series of, of cemetery projects that, that are focused on in that, in that community. But the fact that we're in there looking at a continuum of history from way down at the deep levels all the way up to literally the, the, the present. And, and the video that um, Archaeology Southwest had the honor of being able to work with our videographer here, v Victoria, um, to tell the story of, of early farming in the, s in the Southwest was able to pair, you know, pair away the, the layers of history from the earliest observers w when they arrived as, as Spaniards and go down through the deeper layers to, to reveal how did people, you know, make a living in this environment and then bring that back to the modern day connections to our current uh, native populations that are still here in this, this community. I think that is a really important element of, of historical archaeology is that it really is just part of a broader archaeology, and the less divisions that we put in there, the, mm -hmm. the better we are in particularly communicating with our public audiences. So sorry for the diatribe here, but. <laughs> no, and, and I really, I neglected to mention, and you brought it up, that um, the current president of SHA, Joe Joseph, he's a CRM archaeologist um, at New South in, um, in the Southeast. He said that he bemoans the fact that we don't do our job well enough 
to convey the importance of what we do. And Dwayne Peter, the president of ACRA, does the same thing. And we're constantly reminding ourselves, and I think we all need to do that. That's another challenge to all of us as archaeologists to work with our colleagues and you know respect what they do and think, what can I learn from them? I mean, what can I learn from my uh, colleagues that deal mostly with prehistoric or uh, contact period things? And and um, you know, there just needs to be more collaboration. I actually um, recently have been collaborating with a young cultural anthropologist. And horrors! Can you imagine an archaeologist working? you know, in depth with a uh, cultural anthropologist on, on food stuff and, and gastronomy and, and UNESCO types of issues. And it, he was, uh, what he said to me after I started talking to him, and first of all, I think he was stunned that I actually knew some of the literature. And he said, I had no idea there were people out there like you. And I'm like, don't you have any archaeologists in your department? <laughs> And so, but it was interesting to me that um, th what I've learned from him and what he's actually been open to learning from me is a really important thing, I think, for the future of anthropology as a whole. Um, but, but we all need to, things like Archaeology Southwest or any of the other groups that, that do, that think about archaeology for the public are so critical, not because many of you are drawn to something like Archaeology Cafe because of it, but because it makes it relevant to you, right? And one of the things that drew me to historical archaeology was um, g literally going through my grandma's things that I inherited, and I find them archaeologically. I find almost the same patterns. And, you know, it's sort of, I can, I can look at her life and my grandpa's life and my mother and her siblings, and I see things that I wouldn't see because I wouldn't have had that focus on material culture. Does that make sense? And so one thing about historical archaeologists, we can collect research collections. So I have, I have many of you know my historical ceramic collection that I use a lot for teaching. And so, but, but my favorite pieces are the big platters that somebody saved from the Civil War era. So they're well over 100 years old with all the knife scratches on them from Sunday dinners or holiday dinners. You know, and somebody loved those enough to keep on the cupboard so that they didn't, there were a few chips on them, but they didn't make it into the privy. They're, you know, they made it onto my shelf. So, um, but, I, but I love that kind of thing. And we obviously don't do that with prehistoric things because they're not curated on shelves. You know, they're, they're dug up, so we don't do that. But, um, but I think that love of material culture is really, really a strong thing. And that's another link, Bill, that between prehistoric types and historical types. Okay, I think we've got time for one last question. Nope. I guess it was already answered. Teresita, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. And thank all of you. What a great audience.